What's up? What's going on, everyone? Hey, how's everybody what's doing? Welcome to another you? day of daily gaming news. Yeah. I, I just want to take a quick moment and be like, I moved today into a new space <laughs> and was able to get the internet set up, the computer set up, so that we could be here delivering the news. And I just want to take a moment to talk about two awesome people. One, my wife, who's just been super supportive and great during this process. And I love her so much for, for, for being behind me, making this happen. And Kaiza kicking so much ass with getting this thing together and set up understanding my issues today. Of Thank course. you so much. Thank so excited you. to be here. Thank you for making it. I'm glad you were able to make it. We might have not been able to do the, the show today, but Marone hustled all oh, morning. And, and here we are like a machine <laughs> so let's get right into it let's do it as uh one of these stories is epic games coming out and talking about the playstation 5 and saying quote it is a masterpiece of systems design nick penn warden vp of engineering at epic games spoke with official playstation magazine uk and labeled the ps5 as revolutionary for its various technical capabilities including storage and data compression technology Ben Warden said that the PlayStation 5 is a masterpiece of systems design. Not only is it driving a huge leap in computing and graphics performance, but it's also revolutionary in terms of storage and data compression technology, unlocking new kinds of games and experiences for players to enjoy. Epic Games showcased the Unreal Engine 5 tech demo last month, and the studio later revealed it has been working with Sony for many years on the technology. CEO, Epic CEO Tim Sweeney described Sony's new console as absolutely phenomenal. So hearing this and knowing what they've said before, what do we think? Chat, also, please give us your thoughts. What do we think about the PlayStation 5's design and hardware? I think that it's, you know, it's, it is it is a masterpiece of of design from what we've seen so far with the capabilities it has um, and what it can do and I really like how they wanted to make it look aesthetically um, appealing um, because the PlayStation Five is going to be you know like a part of your home it's probably going to be there right next to your TV um, maybe if you have an Xbox you're going to hide that you know behind your, your <laughs> TV stand somewhere or put it on the side and hope someone doesn't accidentally kick it you know as as they walk by because it's really like the PS Five has been made to be a fixture of your home and I think I I've just been really impressed um, with what I've seen so far. Yeah, same. I, you know, just speaking on the design, I love how they they said we wanted to design something that when somebody walked into your house, it caught their attention. Mm -hmm. You know, and that was something that I was like, yeah, immediately recognize how much attention this this system will will grab. And then just like the the hardware, we've talked about this before. I think the the that that tech demo initially before we did the live event really cemented our, oh my God, I can't wait to have this console in our lives by mm -hmm. seeing that just beautiful, uh, um, you know, um, amount of, of, of information and ray tracing and just everything happening with that, that woman exploring like, like a, a Tomb Raider. Absolutely, and and Coop says, well, a few minutes into the show and we're already at the Xbox design slander. We'll have to do an Xbox special um, when after their next um, after their next event and and give Xbox some praise because we've definitely been on on PlayStation's side of things here. Um, yeah. I I'm really excited um, to you know to see what the PlayStation Five has to offer, and I'm really looking forward to the Tempest Audio with the DualSense controller with haptic feedback. Um, I think is really going to be like next gen is next level. Um, and uh, this this is also really big, you know, coming from Epic Games. Tim Sweeney in the past has also, you know, had a lot of um, I, th I think there was some praise for PlayStation in, in, yeah. in, the, in the past. Early on. Early on. There's been yeah. some um, uh, praise for PlayStation, which makes me wonder if Epic Games is going to be working with them in the future and to what extent um, they will be doing so. Yeah, I, th I, you know, th that is something too that we should take into consideration because Epic Games is killing it. And we've talked about that before. And for them to kind of speak this high praise for, for Sony, I think there's just maybe more of an interest as a developer and as a studio to want to develop for the hardware 
um, because they recognize what they're able to actually pull off. Mm -hmm. And that, that might just be just a more of an immersive experience and less of just a next gen visual upgrade. Because, right. you know, the one thing that Cerny was even talking about that I think you and I were saying, when do we get to see this in action is there's a point that we should expect to see the PlayStation 5 essentially be your system. You know, right. like it will it'll it'll be almost biometrically connected to you, the consumer. And as you can see, this is the tech demo of the PlayStation 5. You oh know, this gosh. was the, the footage that was, was taken and it just goes to show like what it can actually do with these graphics. And um, all of this is comprised of like millions and millions of, of small triangles. Um, and just the extent of what you can do with the PlayStation 5 is just wild. Yeah, and, and this is this was that demo when we were like, Oh wow, this is amazing. Look at everything. I mean, those rocks. I mean, just that that entire thing looks real. Like I look like mm -hmm. I could I could physically be there. Um, the photorealism is just is next level. And then I think it was something I said to you was I felt like I noticed the audio difference right, right. away in this in this tech demo. In, in this tech demo, if if you watch it, it's called Lumen and Nanite, or you could probably just search, you know, PS5 um, tech demo graphics, and it should come up. Um, the way they've designed the audio, you can hear the rocks, like each rock falling and, and where they fall and how far away they all are. And I think it's something you don't really realize you are missing out on until you do hear it, you know, for yourself and you hear it well done. Um, yeah. It's 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 really truly impressive, and it it adds another level of immersion. Yeah. Hey, hey, Beats. What's up? What's uh, up? Yeah, that's a that's that's just that moment too. Is like someone going, you know, I want to save up for this. I want to have this amazing next gen console. Um, Sony is Sony is really driving home why they think you should pick them, mm -hmm. and we are excited to see what Xbox has to offer with its first party titles coming up right right around the corner in, in July. It's just right now, I think, with everything we saw from the Sony uh, event and the tech demo and even Cerny's presentation, though, he has the voice to put you to sleep <laughs> and soothe you. He, he was describing things that a lot of devs were even like, I can't wait to work on this system. Right. If you have seen uh, the presentation by Mark Cerny talking about the specs of uh, the PlayStation 5, um, a lot of consumers were unhappy with it only because they wanted what the PS5 reveal was and they wanted to see the games and they wanted to see the fun and the controller and, and the actual console. But it was just Mark Cerny speaking very calmly and quietly for a full hour about like, what what is it about their SSD that makes it yeah. you know e exciting and unique? And he really goes through um, at a very technical level um, yeah. all you know all the details of what it can do, um, which which I think was um, you know also impressive that you know PlayStation Five was so confident um, in like how impressive its technology was that they were able to really deep dive into that. And I don't think we've seen something similar from Xbox in that regard. No, and, and we do take into account what Phil Spencer uh, over at Xbox was saying is that we don't really understand what next gen is gonna be like. I mm -hmm. think the best way to describe it is going from 2D to 3D is the best way to understand the, the jump to the next gen systems. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then something that Cerny said for a lot of those PC master race individuals out there, which, <laughs> I have I have that mindset to an extent. Um, they talked about how these systems' sole purpose is to run the gaming software. So the way information will be communicated will be faster than what you'll find on a PC that is designed to also handle things outside of gaming. So that's something that I was like, oh, wow, I didn't even think about that. That, that's a great point. I mean, with PC Master Race, like may, maybe you do have a powerful machine, but like at its core, that machine is designed to, you know, do a lot of different things and it's not specifically designed for games. Um, and I, I think that consoles have, or these this generation of consoles has done a great job really, you know, utilizing that to its full extent um, because, you know, some of these systems might run much better than even a, like a very expensive PC could. Um, and at this point, you're buying the equivalent um, in hardware at least a gaming PC when you do buy yep. one of these consoles. And while it's anticipated that these consoles will be around the $500 price range, that is still way less expensive than a $2,000 PC. Absolutely, there's no doubt about that. And I think the more they show off their systems in action and people getting the, you know, uh, the, the, 
the technology of the dual sense controllers, the, ha the haptic feedback, all that stuff that makes it more immersive, mm -hmm. you know, until we start to see more of that kind of technology come out for PC, um, it, you we're kind of like in that place of, well, how, how deep do I want to go into my gaming experience? Absolutely. And and speaking of, you know, new games and beautiful games, we have some news about a highly anticipated one. Yes, a title that we have been excited for since we saw that demo in action is The Ghosts of Tsushima. A Storm is Coming CGI trailer has dropped. So we are a little over two weeks away from the release of Ghost of Tsushima on July 17th, and to help draw up some hype, Sony has released yet another trailer this time featuring full CGI cinematics. So something about Ghost of Tsushima, if you know nothing about this game, is that Tsushima is on the brink of destruction and in the wake of a crushing defeat at the hands of ruthless Mongol invaders. Noble samurai Jin Sakai must sacrifice everything to protect what's left of his home and his people. As he embarks on an epic adventure for the freedom of Tsushima, he must set aside samurai traditions, embrace unconventional methods, and forge a new path, the path of the ghost. Let's take a look at that trailer. You are a samurai, bound to uphold the code. To live, samurai. fight, and die with honor. If you stray from this path, what will you become? A storm so it looks so cool. Jin, come on, Jin. Like I'm ready for this to be like an animated series. Oh my god. I, I, you know, I think when they first announced this game, and I had to like process what I was looking at, and then mm -hmm. the, the address, they addressed it as essentially it's like The Witcher 3, but a samurai story. Right. I was like, I'm already in. You don't have to say anything more. I'm ready. <laughs> Take my money. I thought it was cool that they showed that there was like more fire and, and all the hostility that happens. We also saw a little part of, you know, the, the fighting gameplay and that when you do fight someone, it's not going to be a drawn out battle. It's going to be more like real life where if, you know, you have a sword to the neck, like you're you're dead. That's all. Um, and yeah. and they're, they're really, you know, they're really quick battles. Um, I'm really interested to see more about the lore of this story and what the effects are. If you do play as the ghost versus if you do play, yeah. you know, with honor, I wonder if that's going to affect any of the storyline at all. Um, yeah. And I, I've been really impressed with the graphics on this, especially because we've been consuming so much PS5 content, but this is a PS4 game. Um, but I'm still, you know, I, I'm still blown away by what they've been able to do with the PS4 hardware. I think there is that small hope deep down that the trailer we just witnessed is what the game will be like on the PlayStation 5 when they upgrade to the PlayStation 5. But you said something that I am I am in the same boat there is, you know, when we when we wonder what is going to happen because they addressed the aspect of, of, a, of a morality system that when mm -hmm. you play as the ghost, it will have a negative impact on you because it's not honor to be right. it's not honorable to be this type what it, what does the community do how do they mm -hmm. react to you and does that like you were saying does that actually affect the way the stories play out because if it does the that replay factor right there is already like yes let's do this and also this game comes so close to the end of the ps4 cycle um and i i think that it just shows playstation um playstation owners that you know whatever console you buy it's going to be a good investment like through right through until the ends like new exclusives are going to be coming out for that um and it's 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 really ending the console cycle with a bang here yeah and that's something that that you know I'm I'm really happy with is there's you kind of like get to the end of a console cycle and you're like well what's the game to take us out what what is the game to prepare us for you know 
all that the PS4 has to offer under the hood and and to expect that when you jump to the next gen consoles, it's going to be a hundred times better than this. And this feels like from what we've seen and what we've heard that this is all of those ingredients as, as the proper send off for the PlayStation 4. And I guess we'll even get, we'll even potentially get games for the PlayStation 4 after the PS5 comes out if Cyberpunk maybe gets delayed again or if it's announced or if the PS5 is, is announced to come out. Um, you know, before that, um, I, I think that it's it's really good for like the loyalty of, of PlayStation owners, um, and I'm I'm imp I'm thoroughly impressed. Yeah, uh, Kane, there is no multiplayer uh, for this title. I believe it's a pure single player experience, mm -hmm. and and beats to to what you were saying there too is like yeah, you can play as the ghost the entire time. You can you can handle all of your encounters that way. And, and I'm so curious now when you go to do that, what is the outcome in which you, you are uh, uh, faced with as the story progresses? Because I've been seeing on social media, some, some people are getting to review the game right now. Mm -hmm. And I'm a, little, I'm a little jelly, just a right. little jelly. Uh, but, you know, it's coming out soon and, and we get to just dive in. Also, that, that black and white mode that right. they have in there as well there is a black and white mode um so you can play the game and feel as if you're in like an old samurai movie they've taken a lot of inspiration from those samurai movies and, and samurai lore um you know w within those films and have really taken that to heart and included those in the game yeah and and is this is this a game we've been waiting for for quite some time if we think about it like as a samurai game i can only think of one other samurai game that comes to mind and that was more of like not as the way they portray samurai in this reality. Mm -hmm. I was I was thinking of Onimusha, but Onimusha has a little bit more of that kind of like magical sense to it. Right. I I can't think of any samurai games that I've played. I feel like there's a lot of like in in that same vein, kind of like nin, ninja stuff, or um, but not really uh, you know much about samurai. I think there's yeah. a lot about swords, or maybe more about you know Western culture when it comes to you know this this era of time um, that games are about. And I I think that this is a big you know this is this is a big win also even just for representation in gaming. Um, and you know, yeah. adding adding more of you auto know worldly stories. Um, sorry if that was really loud. I assume chat heard that auto shut down on my on my headset. Um, so it's it's a good day for samurai fans. Yeah, I I I can't agree more with the the fact that this is this is I think it's the right time. You know, it's the right place for this type of story, the inclusivity of this type of story. I'm excited to 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 see the the culture, to see Auto shut down, uh, what they have to show. Charging battery. There's a there's a friend of mine who's in this game, um, and his name's Patrick Gallagher, and he was saying that the the story is just it's one that they're like they didn't try to sugarcoat anything, and they didn't attempt to take out anything that might you know polarize uh, people who aren't from this type of culture mm -hmm. and background, but that this game is is true to the source material of this time period. That's really important, um, I, I think, to, you know, to, <laughs> uh, the auto shutdown has been saved. I love it. The headset uh, oh seems gosh. excited, too. I love it. <laughs> very excited. Uh, it, it is important, and I think that's even a problem, you could say, in, like, um, American-based games. I, I mean, we're not going to get too far into it, but with some, some games like Call of Duty, where they, you know, harken back to some history, sometimes that history is in, inaccurate, or it's been kind of yeah. changed, um, and so there's you know some um you know debate about that and i think at the you know at the very least like this game should you know put its history in uh in an accurate you know uh, it should depict it accurately it should you know portray you know people in a good light that should be portrayed in a good light um yeah. and not add to just kind of a stereotype of what a lot of gamers may think that uh, that samurai are that's a that's a really good point, and and something that you and I have you know discussed uh, uh, many times is kind of like where where gaming can be fun, but also be very educational and mm -hmm. informative, and help people understand. You know, sometimes when you're in the same region for a long time, you just don't understand culture outside mm -hmm. of your own daily life and uh it, it's sometimes necessary that we get a chance to explore these worlds and these realities 
and be informed of them. Um, because then hopefully, hopefully, we're the type of people that can actually absorb this information and grow from it and become more multicultural and inclusive versus uh, uh, closed-minded as we kind of see in, the, in a little bit of today's society, unfortunately. Unfortunately, you made a good point about, you know, this is the way that a lot of people will, you know, learn about things, you know, e even by accident. I, th I think it's an opportunity, you know, to use this as also an educational tool, even if you don't realize it's being used in that way. Um, it reminds me of a game called, I think it's 1979 Revolution, or it's about the Ira it's about the Iranian Revolution, oh, wow. um, I believe. And I think it was actually banned um, in some places because of you know, how revealing it was about the era. So I don't think, I think it's 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 cool that there are some games that do that. I don't think every game has that responsibility necessarily. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it, did, Rixi says, didn't Assassin's Creed do a similar yeah. thing to, um, they've been trying to, you know, at least with their with their newer games, especially, you know, really pay attention to the history um, to the point of including things like flighting in Assassin's Creed Valhalla, which is, it is battle rap among Vikings. But yeah. That it's historically accurate because yep. back in that era, they did have, you know, um, one on ones in prose that would like um, diss, you know, their opponent. And it's like, that's, that is modern day battle yeah. rap. Yep. Yeah. And, 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 you know, something Arrow, I, I, I think that's a, that's an honest thing to say these days because we're seeing developers recognize this. We're seeing directors and studios understand if we're gonna, we're gonna tell a story that's rooted in, in real history, we need to be true to that. And that mm -hmm. is what it sounded like they're trying to do with uh, Assassin's Creed Valhalla. I think that was something that DICE attempted to do with Battlefield One, with mm -hmm. portraying what war was like and what that experience was like. I felt like going back to a game that we are going to see an iteration of coming up on in virtual reality, but Medal of Honor. Mm -hmm. Medal of Honor was another one of those games that wanted to portray what that experience was like within war and and show you that you know it's it's you know it's ugly and and it's hard and people went through this. So yes, I I believe wholeheartedly that you tell your parents I'm learning when I'm playing video games. <laughs> right, I'm sure they'll be happy to hear that. I, I think with the responsibility that you know games have to really go beyond the stereotype is is more is more important now than ever because maybe 10 years ago um, you could kind of get away I guess with you know with certain yeah. stereotypes or you know not really you know b being accurate but I think in you know the current state of society like if you have something that will um, look like a bad stereotype um, and not really honor the history, like that is going to get so much backlash. Yeah, that's a, that's, yeah, I, I, I hope for anybody that might be watching or watch at a later date, if you're pursuing this, this industry and it's something that you want to do or, or, you know, you yourself are involved with it or you have, you know, message boards, it, community feedback is very important. And I think that's something that needs to be spoken about. You know, that's, that's something for me that uh, I have like uh, Italian blood in me. And there's a mm -hmm. time period in which most Italians was portrayed as like these mobsters, you know, these types of individuals. But there was a lot of time in that history where there was a lot of persecution mm -hmm. amongst the Irish. Anybody who was coming, you know, off the boat on Ellis Island, they were going through things like this. So sometimes I feel like uh, a setting, like you said, like 10 years ago could have been glorified too much in a way that you were like, Oh, I'll allow this to, right. to, to be, but now we're in a time period where we're so informed that it's like you have no excuse to uh, misrepresent the, the, the truth of what actually happened. Absolutely. So our next story is about a new battle royale because we need one more of those. <laughs> That's how I felt when I saw this was I was like, oh, another battle royale. Oh, it's from Ubisoft, and oh, it's going to be revealed on July 2nd, and it is currently called Hyperscape. So the official website for Hyperscape has gone live, confirming earlier reports that Ubisoft is working on a new Battle Royale. So news broke out earlier yesterday that Ubisoft was preparing to announce a new Battle Royale game, and as it turned out, it was completely true. In a now live website, which belongs to the development team known as Prisma Dimensions, it has now been confirmed that Hyperscape will be revealed on July the 2nd. 
and there is a brief description of the game found on the website. The description reads, Prisma Dimensions is thrilled to bring you the first iteration of the Hyperscape on July 2nd, and with it, the pulse-pounding action of Crowd Rush. Get ready to drop into the neon-drenched streets of the world's premier virtual city, Neo Arcadia. You'll want to hit the ground running, as you'll need every advantage you can find to give yourself a leg up on the competition. Only the best contenders will make it to the final showdown. Will you claim victory or fall to the perils of the Hyperscape? goes on to say that here at Prisma, we build meaningful connections that span the globe and foster development. We build new frontiers that nurture, educate, and connect the population. We build technologies that push the limits of this world and offer an escape route to new dimensions, and we do this for you. Our mission is to provide you with unique opportunities to grow and prosper in today's hyper-connected world. A world with limitless opportunities, a world waiting for you to discover it. Let us take you there. And along with this small snippet of detail, they also have shown a glimpse at some of the concept art. So we have some concept art um, right here to show you. Um, the concept art shows how this looks very cyberpunky um, and very futuristic as well. So let's take a look at that. And that is something, if you think about it, is like, wait, a cyberpunk battle royale? Does that exist right now? Right? That's what this really feels like, is that, you know, it, it is very cyberpunky. It looks, you know, incredibly futuristic. Um, with the cityscapes, I yesterday we were talking about we're going to see more and more, you know, cyberpunky games. And this game really looks like it fits that description. Yeah. And and that that is that is a, a really good point there because it's it's I'm into it. You know what I mean? Like that's that moment of being like I like these settings and the battle royale. I I get it. Like like Beats was saying, they want that sweet Fortnite money. They want that um, sweet Fortnite money. It makes sense. It it makes sense to me. I wonder how popular it will be because I'm. I'm kind of fatigued about how many battle royales have come out over the past few years, but this game does look really cool. Yeah, and and the original leak on Hyperscape said that they will be releasing this month on PC and consoles with cross-platform play coming later this year, and it's set to be heavily focused on the streaming platform with Twitch and its partners. That makes me wonder if something is going to happen that's similar to Valorant. Um, where, you know, Valorant had drops enabled only on Twitch. So, you know, you had to be watching Twitch if you wanted to be able to play Valorant. And uh, I think Ninja even had kind of a salty tweet about that, about how he couldn't, you know, engage in that kind of program because he was on Mixer at the time. Um, mm. Sorry to Mixer, that Mixer will soon be no more. Um, but it, it makes me wonder if, if they're going to try to have a huge launch on Twitch, um, which I think is really good for streamers as well as for yeah. the game because some of the numbers from the Valorant drops on Twitch were in the hundred thousands, I think even two hundred thousands on on you know on one stream at at some point. And it's um it's I think it's great that it gives a lot of visibility to streamers themselves as well. Yeah, and you know, it is an oversaturated market. Battle Royale, we can all say is like, oh wow, really? I'm cool with it if they do something fresh. They mm -hmm. do something that hasn't been done, and they they make the experience feel um, uh, unique. Now, if this is just like, yeah, it's your typical BR, and it's just set in this kind of setting, and that's it, then yeah, th this game won't be able to to do anything. Because if we look at like Fortnite, one of the unique aspects of Fortnite is the building, right? Mm -hmm. The building right. aspect of Fortnite within a BR is crazy. Now, if this has some sort of, because you notice how they're like running on a wall or whatever, mm -hmm. if this has some sort of like mirror's edge element to it, that yeah. would be pretty cool. I, I also wonder what it's going to bring to the table because every battle royale does, you know, have its own flair. Um, with Warzone having, you know, contracts and now and you, the ability to like respawn, also like yeah. sometimes too many times. Um, and they just dropped the two hundred player oh, quads. Wow. Yeah. Have you played it yet? I haven't. No, I just uh, I just actually got the notification of the update. But uh, yeah, two hundred. <laughs> 200 
Someone in the chat says PUBG has its lag. PUBG um, <laughs> doesn't work for a lot of uh, for a lot of players on their computers. Hopefully, they have since fixed that issue. You know, Fortnite has building and its unique art style. Um, Call of Duty Blackout. I don't know what it brought to the table. I don't know what CS:GO's um, Danger Zone brought to the table that you know maybe wasn't exciting enough for gamers or wasn't different enough. Um, I, I hope that this game has cool new features. If it is something like running up the wall, if there's going to be you know any cool abilities or abilities that yeah. you know could be related to the technology, like maybe there's something yeah. um, similar to body modification that we've seen in Cyberpunk 2077. Um, I think there are so many directions um, that this game could take. It also sounds like the whole game takes place in just one city. So yeah. I wonder what that means for the environment and how you know that fits into the gameplay as well. Also, looking at this concept art, we're high up. And I wonder if this is maybe a space of BR where you maybe move further up the buildings mm -hmm. and maybe you that is part of the the aspect of the circle closing and it becoming a tighter space. Right, if there's uh, a lot of like know. vertical, you know, vertical yeah. play. Um, similar to how, you know, Fortnite has that, but you have to build the buildings yourself. <laughs> maybe, you know, in, in this game, you can, you know, just climb those or maybe go into them. I feel like I could see a lot of campers with a lot of buildings. It seems yeah. like there'll be a lot of places to hide, or at least, you know, from this, you know, one concept art, you know, snippet that we have here, um, that, that could really come into play strategy wise of how you're going to win that battle royale. Yeah, and also, like something we saw yesterday with Sin, is this might be one of those spaces where the... This is an area of, of Warzone that I think suffers, is the aspect of customization here mm -hmm. could be endless. Whereas with Warzone, it's, it's pretty weak. I mean, that is one of the downfalls of that game, is the... the, the the aspect of making a character more like you just isn't there. Mm -hmm. I see the same character models all the time, and I see the same gun models all the time. Nothing really stands out. Whereas when I look at you play Fortnite or see other people play Fortnite, it is clear, like, this character is yours. I think Fortnite has done such a good job of skins coming out that, like, every other time I open the item shop, I'm like, oh, do I want to spend money on this game? It's so, it's so easy to spend money in Fortnite. They have made it incredibly, you know, easy um, to, you know, to, to spend, really, on these skins. Um, I wonder if there will be a lot of microtransactions in this game. I assume there's going to be a battle pass just based on the trend of how it's seemingly every multi player game right now has a battle pass, um, at least in yeah. battle royales. Um, definitely. Um, I hope this game, you know, has a strategy that also makes it unique to the other multiplayer games that are out there. Um, strategy, you know, you know, in terms of their growth or how they're going to keep players around because mm -hmm. with the demand for new content and, and new patch updates all the time, it's also really hard on developers. So I wonder if, you know, they're also going to pay attention to uh, the, the back end and the behind the scenes um, to make sure that we don't hear an article in, you know, in, in a couple months that says these developers have been, you know, severely overworked. Yeah, and July 2nd's right around the corner, so make sure to tune in with us when we uh, talk more about this and hopefully see the game in action, see if it feels like, hey, it's going to be something unique, or mm -hmm. we'll be back here to trash it like Xbox. I don't know. I don't <laughs> I'm know. kidding, I'm kidding. That was for Coombs. That was for Coombs. <laughs> So that brings us into our next story. Um, uh, we have some words from the developers of Valorant. Yes. So the Valorant devs are, I love you, Kim, still worry. Uh, the Valorant devs are aiming to have six new agents per year, and that a new mode will be available prior to episode two is more than likely. Valorant officially launched earlier this month. Really, this month? It feels like forever ago that Valorant has been yeah. launched. So of Valorant course. officially launched earlier this month, and the response from players has been solid. But what's next for Riot Games' free-to-play hero shooter? Well, Valorant executive producer Anna Donlin has provided a bit of a roadmap for the game in her latest dev diary. And it sounds like Riot is going to be keeping new content coming on a pretty regular schedule. So if you haven't yet seen the dev diary, um, we have it here and we're going to live react along with you. Yeah. And yes, Kai, it is the end of the month. June has been one of the slowest months. Yes. For me, ever. 
All right, let's take a look. Hey everyone, it feels like forever since we've chatted. I'm still working from home, as you can see, as is the entire Valorant dev team. And it was crazy shipping this game from home, away from the office, away from the team, away from all of our work stuff. I love her room. But I'm still super yeah. glad we did it because now the game is finally officially in your hands and we can start on this journey together. So we launched the game and it is really hard for game developers to let their work go. We never know if it's quite good enough, if it's done, if it's ready. But the reality is the game's never gonna be done. This is just the start for us. You're always gonna be finding new things for us to work on, to improve, to chase. And so it's not like the teams all moved on to their next big game. This is their big game and they're all hard at work on a bunch of new things. And that's what I'm here to give you an update on today. Ranked mode. So we knew that ranked was going to be the most important thing to get out there. And I know it feels like it took forever. It felt like forever to us as well. And now that that's out, now what? So what you can expect over the next couple of months are a number of quality of life improvements to the game, things we've heard you asking for directly. And a lot of those may have already shipped by the time this video comes out. Those are things like early surrender, the ability to remake mm -hmm. matches, yeah. timeouts. I need we want to get a little more protection in there <sighs> for our streamers. We've also made a number of UX improvements it. based on feedback we've heard from you. And then obviously you're going to see the regular cadence of bug fixes and balance changes in order to keep the game in a really healthy state. Nice. Yeah. You can expect the next big content drop at the beginning of Act 2. So let's talk a little bit, actually, about episodes and acts. Where all episodes are meant are to last about six months, with acts lasting about two months each. So three acts per episode. We're gonna ask for a little flexibility here because we need to navigate around things like holidays and such, but that's pretty that's much nice. the cadence that we're targeting. Agents will release at the beginning of an act. So if your math skills are awesome, you figured out that we're targeting about six agents a year. Which is a lot. This is another place where we're gonna yes, need a little flexibility because we really need to follow your cues here. How many agents are too many? How many are too few? But right now six is the sweet spot, so six is what we're targeting. Episodes and acts are also where we'll start telling some of the game's story. Now, some of you are like, story, who cares? I care! And others of you are like, why the heck is there a giant island floating in the sky? And what are all these glowy boxes doing all over the place? We'll start peeling back the layers of the game's story over the course of the year, with significantly more to come around episode two. Some of you are already starting to piece it together, which has been really cool to watch. Yeah, Kai, Battle passes will also cool. release act to act, so three per episode, the and then skins and such every week right or two now. throughout. Now, major features will likely release at the start of an episode. That doesn't mean that we're not going to try some stuff out between now and the beginning of episode two, but we want the start of an episode to feel significant, like an evolution of the game. So you can expect bigger things to happen at an episode start. Things like a map release, or like I mentioned, a major new feature release. As for game, game modes, modes, this is a place where we're actually accelerating development. Probably draw me back you know, to the beginning. originally we had only planned to launch with the core bomb mode, but what we heard right out of the gate from all of you was that you were looking for a downtime mode, something shorter. Yes, and so we released please. Spike Rush, but that team is just getting started. And we're not really sure yet exactly when we're going to release modes, whether that's at the act level or the episode level. But what I can say is that you're likely to see a new one before the beginning of episode two. So why episodes? Why don't we just call them seasons? Well, right. depending on what game you're mm -hmm. joining us from, seasons can mean a whole host of things. It can mean the beginning of ranked progression. It could mean the beginning of an esports season. It could mean a major new content drop. That is true. It does all of those things can really mean the start of a yeah. season. And so for us, it's about getting all of those things to come together in our game that we feel really comfortable with. And once that's there, we'll be ready to commit to when things start. Is there and another game out there doing that annually, episodic? twice a year, what I have don't you? Think so. so yeah, we've been hard at work on a ton of stuff, and we Not are really excited it. for you. Yeah, to point us at the right next stuff to tackle. That puts them in their own space. Real quick before I go, there are players out there who are determined to make the game miserable for there everybody. There are a lot of them. I feel like we have a pretty decent handle on the cheaters, though that will be an ongoing battle. But what we're doing less well is in disruptive behavior. I made a huge commitment here at launch, and I mean it. I have funded an entire team of humans to focus on nothing else, and you'll see their work rolling out over the coming uh, months. Wow. Awesome. We could really use your help. Like any system, it needs data in order to get stronger. So please use our reporting tools and get us that data so we can make those systems even stronger than they are today. We're working on a way to let you know when your reports actually have an action taken on yeah. them. But mm -hmm. in the meantime, please know we are actively restricting and banning players based on those reports. So please keep reporting those people so we can make the one game a healthier place for like, everybody. Hey, we banned this All person right, that that's it for me for now. Thanks so much for playing the game. 
Thanks so much for hanging out and listening to me talk. Hey, that's what we did. Keep letting us know what you're looking for, and I'll keep popping in and letting you know what we're up to. Also, be sure to check out our Ask Valorant series. We'll use that space to answer questions submitted by you, the community, probably every two weeks or so. You know, thanks everyone. This is something that that I think we can talk about is like it is really cool to see what what they're doing with this um, and and how this game is is really uh, p- pushing forward a kind of like a new narrative within within gaming. Right. I initially I, I'm glad she addressed really all the questions that I had, like even down to, you know, why is it called an episode? I just assumed it was like a marketing thing similar to how they wanted to have their rank names like be, be unique because it was it felt more of like a marketing thing to me. But, you know, mm-hmm. that that was a very good point that seasons do mean different things in, in League of Legends. A season is pretty much a year and a season is where you work up your rank versus, you know, for, for other games, it's something more fleeting and it's more of just like which content and, yeah. and which events are going to happen you know in you know a certain time frame really yeah. so i, I think it, it, it's cool that they're calling them episodes as well although it is a little confusing about um the episodes and how they have like different segments uh w- within them um, yeah. or how each one is, is two months or the, or, or the, the way that was just uh, ex- explained i feel like i still don't quite follow but i, I yeah. think it's a cool idea i was thinking about that as well excuse me uh i was actually thinking about that for why would they go the episodic route for multiplayer shooter tactical shooter and then i was thinking about what kind of has been in the rumor mill about riot focusing on an animated concept for Mm -hmm. league of legends potentially and the potential that they could be shifting into being a place that has more than just gaming in it Mm -hmm. and so this could be their way of of continuing into that space where the the story will slowly reveal itself the same way you would see throughout a TV show. And then we might at one point actually begin to see a TV show Mm -hmm. or an animated narrative circle around these acts as well. It just, it feels very purposeful that they're making these choices to play out for things in the years to come. It, it, it does. It really does relate to, you know, the, the bigger theme of just content around Valorant and not just the actual, you know, the actual game itself. So Valorant's live service um, will consist of episodes, each of which will contain three acts of about two months each, meaning each episode will be about six months long. Donlin warns the schedule may have to end up being a bit flexible, but two episodes and six acts per year is what they're aiming for for now. The beginning of a new episode will usually be when Riot will add maps or major new features as they want episodes to feel like they're changing the game in a major way. And meanwhile, each new act will offer up a new agent and battle pass, as well as various tweaks, balance changes, and other updates. The dev diary contains a small tease for the game's 12th agent as we see a mysterious silhouette as Donlin discusses future agents. In addition to new agents and other content, the Dev Diary promises various quality of life improvements over the next couple of months, including early surrender, timeouts, and the ability to remake matches. She also promises more story content will be fo- folded into the game starting around the launch of episode two. And I, I think that these are really important. I feel like they wanted to get the game up and running, um, but without these features, it does make it very difficult to play. Um, yeah. because it's it's just really you know discouraging if I go into like a 40 minute Valorant game and right off the bat it's a 4v5 you know the whole time you're sitting there being like do I just take the L and like alt F4 out of this game and maybe be yeah. banned because we all know that no one's going to win this anyway um, and I usually try to look at it as even if we don't win the game I could still you know improve my skills here but but a lot of times it does just seem you know hopeless or, or there's also no point in learning how to win a 4v5 really um so is, is that a useful skill and i'm sitting here thinking of those things the whole time while playing the game instead of actually you know playing the game yeah uh so i guess that that's a wonderful question which is have we been playing Valorant? i haven't really i played a few games of spike rush um, if I have maybe a, a 20 minute window and you know I don't have anything I can really get done in that time, I'll just hop into some Spike yeah. Rush. Um, but for me, Spike Rush is too short and a full game of Valorant is too long um, that I've only just been playing Spike Rush in, in certain bits. How about you? How about chat? I, I haven't played Valorant since the beta. Um, I think there was just, 
an aspect of variety that didn't speak to me. And now to see what the future holds for Valorant, I mm -hmm. could find myself jumping back into the space. Mm -hmm. um, so that that is something that I'm that I'm I'm very much uh, interested in seeing how it plays out. I feel the same way. Um, I feel kind of bad that I'm not playing Valorant, you know, while it's while it's early. But I would like, you know, some more agents. I would like, you know, maybe some more variety in in yeah. game modes. Um, it is very. It, it does feel very repetitive sometimes. Um, if you're playing on, I think there's only two maps right now: Split and Haven. Um, I believe, and yeah. um, each game can kind of feel the same if it's the same five agents versus the other same five agents yeah. or so. Um, and I, I'm a little salty that the agents I unlocked in the beta aren't also unlocked, you know, since the game has launched. Yeah. So I'm like, do I want to play all these games with agents I don't like just to get to Viper? Um, and um, I, I think I'll probably, you know, play more when there are new features out and just yeah. still kind of continue to dabble in Spike Rush. Um, but I, I do think it's going to take, you know, a few months for Valorant to really get up and running. Yeah, you said something that I was like, yeah, that's true. It's, it's, it's like right now is the time you should be playing the game to get better at it. So when all these things are added, but you're, you're right. I just can't find myself willing to, you know, put in the hours to get it down. Because there's a reality of the fact that some people who just have been these CSGO players for so long, mm -hmm. they jumped over into the game and they're just monsters already <laughs> so for me as someone with no background in that whatsoever i'm like i don't i don't want to get so destroyed like this this is can they take into account the hours someone spent in csgo please because <laughs> this is crazy it's it's wild and you know pro teams already being put together hundred thieves has its roster already set up um i don't know if that's too soon i mean maybe not if you know this is the game and you know there's um, there's only so much variety that can happen that we have seen so far um, in, in gameplay. There, you know, an, there's an infinite amount of different plays and different strategies that, that you could take. But with the current state of the game and the current meta or the current style of gameplay, yeah. um, I don't know if it's too soon or not. Um, I know a lot yeah. of people are, are really hyped to, you know, support Valorant and support, you know, their favorite esports organization in that regard. Um, I think in the meanwhile, we're probably going to see a lot more, you know, content tournaments such as Ninjas. Mm -hmm. Um, tournament with T1 um, and I think we're going to see Valorant as more of kind of a, a buzzword in the content world and on YouTube yeah. maybe um, more than you know people or, or your friends you know playing the game that's a that's a that's a good observation you know it, 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 it even like asks the question of like should sh should people wait before we see more pro teams come together uh, mm -hmm. or is it is now the right time to to see these these pro teams come together mm -hmm. and i wonder you know what form that's really going to uh take shape in um i yeah i i feel like the the game has a lot to a lot of potential um, yeah. Right now, I mean, we, we've we've talked in the past about how apparently Overwatch League pros all jump into a game of Valorant after playing Overwatch. So there is, yeah. you know, uh, uh, gamers are hungry um, to see more for this. And I'm I'm glad they touched upon um, the reporting system and the harassment that has been happening in Valorant because that is also a reason why I have yeah. been tentative, you know, to get into these games, particularly ranked games, because what I've been seeing on social media, you know, with how people are talking over voice chat is just horrible. Yeah. Um, and I think that there there are measures that they could take of if someone harasses you over voice chat, like they could have a recording of that, um, you know, in the system. And that could be, you know, a, a permanent ban for someone. Um, I don't know if they're willing to be that aggressive. I, I don't think that they've um, stepped back too much after the backlash about Vanguard, because yeah. I was kind of worried that since Valorant became a bit of a meme after Vanguard was just so powerful. People were yeah. thinking, why does Val why does a uh, Vanguard and Valorant like need all this access, you know, to my computer at the like system level? Um, so I, I'm glad to see that they haven't, you know, shied away from from those kinds of things. Yeah, same, same, and and uh, it is just that healthy, healthy uh, uh, respect for Riot Games, mm -hmm. uh, what they've done, what they'll do, and that uh, I think we should expect to see Valorant in its prime, maybe maybe in a year, maybe maybe two, mm -hmm. but 
I think we'll start to see it, it rising to the level that we think it's going to hit uh, in, a, in, in, in about that time. I've also really liked all the kind of cinematics they've put out so far because they haven't really formally announced, at least not that I'm aware of, of, of any sort of animated series, sort of how League of Legends has been putting out, you know, short, maybe five minute videos about each character. Valorant hasn't officially said they're doing any of that, yeah. but it seems like they pretty much are. Um, or seems at least, a little sus. <laughs> it, seems, it seems a little sus, or at least with, you know, each, uh, each big announcement, you know, maybe for like each map, there's probably like a little cinematic video. And, and I like that trend because Fortnite has been putting a lot of um, content in that regard and even though it's not officially like an animated series it is still I, I think getting its you know dipping its toes in the water getting its feet wet and you know being really primed for that if they do you know eventually want to launch um, something like that yeah we'll be on the lookout and see what happens uh, but our last story that we'll be talking about today is one that I think every single owner of a Nintendo Switch has felt is that Nintendo is finally apologizing for Joy-Con drift amidst its lawsuit. I don't know a Switch player that hasn't talked about Joy-Con drift. I don't have it yet on my Switch, but I am terrified that it's eventually going to affect me. So the Nintendo Switch is a fantastic console, but when it comes to the Switch's Joy-Con controllers, many, many players have experienced issues with something known as Joy-Con drift. While this issue hasn't affected all players, there have been many reports of Switch users finding that their controllers sometimes register movement without the analog stick having been touched. I just wanted to be known that on day two of owning the Switch, I had this issue with Breath of the Wild where Link really? just started to move around and I was like, I just got you. What are you doing? <laughs> oh, You're no. not even moving. It was, yeah, it was, it was crazy. And if you just do a little bit of Googling, you can find plenty of complaints regarding this. As players have been reporting on Joy-Con drift since the hybrid console's release back in 2017, and now three years later, Nintendo has finally apologized for the issue. During a Japanese Q&A meeting via Nintendo Life, Nintendo President Shintaro Furukawa finally apologized for the, quote, inconvenience caused by Joy-Con Drift. However, due to an ongoing lawsuit around Joy-Con Drift, Furukawa could not say any more. An apology from Nintendo may be too little too late, as a class action lawsuit has been filed against Nintendo of America by U.S. law firm CSN, CSKND on behalf of purchasers of Switches and Joy-Con controllers, given the quote-unquote alleged defects. Sorry to hear that, Rebithy. Right, Aaron? Yeah, I'm sorry about that. I'm scared that it's going to happen to me. Apparently, um, you can also, there's like a certain type of, of spray that you can get into your, um, yeah. onto your um, sticks that will help fix the issue a little bit. But Nintendo released a statement to The Verge saying, quote, at Nintendo, we take great pride in creating quality products and we are continuously making improvements to them. We are aware of recent reports that some Joy-Con controllers are not responding correctly. We want our consumers to have fun with Nintendo Switch. And if anything falls short of this goal, we always encourage them to visit support.nintendo.com so we can help. And this lawsuit was first filed back in July of 2019 with the Nintendo Switch Lite added to the suit a few months later following similar reports of drifting controls. Oh no! So hopefully <sighs> Nintendo will fix this issue in any future hardware, but until then, the company is offering to fix drifting Joy-Con controllers free of charge. So if you As want to they send... Should. As they should. So if you want to send in your Joy-Cons, I don't know if, you know, COVID-19 is going to be affecting that, um, at least with the rate of, you know, how fast they can fix those. And in the meanwhile, you can look up that spray and kind of fix them yourself. Um, but this is a big bummer to say the least that it's such a widespread issue. And I'm glad they at least acknowledged it, I think is, yeah. you know, step one. Yeah, and it's funny too, because like we associate Nintendo with high quality games, but do we actually associate it with high quality hardware? 
I, one of my friends who bought the Switch said that he's kind of terrified to even use the Joy-Cons because mm. it felt, they felt more like toys versus, yes. you know, like an Xbox controller or a PlayStation controller where it's, it's heavier, it's sturdier, like you shouldn't throw it, but if you do, it's probably going to be okay. Um, but with Joy-Cons, like I'm very careful around my Joy-Cons. I feel like if I drop them, like they might crack, you know, if it's <laughs> on like a hardwood floor and like that's kind of it. I, I think in the the past their consoles have been you know very it's sturdy or at least you know with like the with um you know with what they've put out but this makes me feel like i shouldn't look to nintendo you know when it comes to hardware yeah that that is an unfortunate point because i remember like if we think of like og nintendo Mm -hmm. We're talking, all I had to do was blow down the cartridge and the game would work. Right. Maybe slap it a little bit and it would work. Like that kind of hardware, even though for its time, you were like, it, it fixed the problem and it, and it made it fine. Mm -hmm. I, I will say is like the Switch has felt like it's gotten some fair share of, I don't know, maybe just poor design overall. Right. I... I... I think that the actual, you know, screen part seems to be very well made, but I'm still, I guess I, I still feel like kind of scared to move it around too much because I'm like, oh, this is like a whole computer like in this and I'm just like holding it and moving it around. Like I should, you know, keep it docked <sighs> as much as I can. <sighs> Oh, yeah, but maybe that's just me, you know, being being um, like oh, like too uh, anxious about it. Um, yeah, I'm I'm was surprised that they even acknowledged Joy-Con drift, honestly, because I, I feel like Nintendo isn't doesn't listen to their community a lot of the time um, in regards to esports, in regards to, you know, the Joy-Con drift. I feel yeah. like they are great at putting out incredible and phenomenal games. But, you know, yeah. when it comes to that being a two way street, I think Nintendo is kind of the opposite of what the Valorant, you know, developers have been doing. Yep. And the same, too, with the 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 comment there about the servers can't agree more that's mm -hmm. always been an issue uh for right. the switch light just you want to play online it's gonna be a bumpy ride it's gonna be really hard if you want to play online so i'm i hope we see more from nintendo in regards to fixing these joy con controllers or what that means you know for their next hardware um but yeah. that does bring us to the end of our show we did it we made it I'm so happy that we were able to pull this off today with everything <laughs> going on. This was great. And and really, just thank you, everybody, for being here, joining in on the chat with us and discussing and sharing your thoughts. We couldn't do this without you. We really appreciate you all. Thank you so much for being a part of this. And of course, you know, the VOD automatically posts to Twitch and it will be on YouTube as well if you want to catch this show again. But thank you so much for joining us. We look forward to seeing you tomorrow. I am Kaisa. <laughs> I am Marone, and for daily gaming news, make sure you tune in at 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time right here on Twitch's daily gaming news. Thank you so much. See you tomorrow. Bye, everybody.